Awesome. <clears throat> okay. Um, what about this? Uh, and I hear this from lots and lots and lots of skeptics, tons of times. They go, "Hey, look, here's the issue. You mention, okay, the universe began to exist. Fine. This doesn't mention God. Your argument doesn't even mention God. Therefore, it's irrelevant to the discussion of God's existence. I hear this a lot. Yeah. I've heard. And the thing is that atheists online, they tend to get their material, just like Christians, they get their material from Christians online, right? They get their material from other atheists that are online. So it's just this oft repeated claim, like kind of like a, like a, like a smackdown, like boom, you know, I can throw your whole yeah. argument out the window. Uh, what's your response to this, that the argument yeah. doesn't mention God? <clears throat> Yeah, so the, the the thing that happens is, I've heard atheists say, it's somewhat a, a not very interesting of an argument, because what if I just granted the whole thing, you still don't have God, like you said. The problem is, we should never skip the Kalam, because this, this formal argument we've given, because the thing is, we will then inevitably get to things in the conceptual analysis that comes after the argument that we would have covered in the in the Kalam, like the universe can't be past infinite and stuff like that that would have come up in those discussions. And um, so that's this is why a while ago I said, when I'm discussing this, just to be very nuanced and very specific, because a lot of people like, to, you know, if you've got a YouTube channel, people like to pick apart everything you say. I try to be careful and say a case that begins with the Kalam. Mm -hmm. But it's always the case. It is always the case that whenever a, a Christian apologist brings the Kalam, they always follow it with a conceptual analysis. So much so that when somebody talks about the Kalam, all of that just in our heads all kind of comes together, uh, even though the Kalam is referring to that formal syllogism. So your question actually sets up a great segue to talk more about the conceptual analysis mm -hmm. because that's where it in inevitably leads. Yeah, and we're going to do that right now, and then we're going to go to your guys' questions. Um, but <clears throat> but just as a reminder, yeah, like when I actually witness to people with this, I start with the conceptual analysis. Like, what could have create? What could have caused the universe? And if they push against me, well, I don't think it was caused. And then I can say, well, everything that begins to exist has a cause. And and then you bring them back to this conceptual analysis. So so here's where like yeah. the the payoff is here. It's in the conceptual analysis. The Kalam forces you to do this. That's that's all it's really ultimately doing. Is my view. Um, <clears throat> now. I've had some people say, okay, conceptual analysis, right? You've got something that's like spaceless, timeless, it's not material, um, it has all these qualities. Um, and I've, I've heard a response, I'm not kidding, from, I'm taking these from real people, right? Atheists who say, well, I would just say that maybe, why, why can't that be a teacup orbiting Saturn? There's a spaceless, timeless, immaterial, super powerful teacup orbiting Saturn and that's the thing that created everything. Uh, well, <laughs> I, I'm sorry to bring this up. But somebody thinks this is a good argument. What's your response to it? Well, what the person ends up doing is just describing God and calling it a teacup, right? It's a spaceless, timeless, non-material, sufficiently powerful mind, and we're going to call it a teacup. <laughs> Honestly, in my preparation uh, for debating Matt Dillahunty, I had heard him talk about this, and I would heard him say he didn't use a teacup. He said, maybe it's a group of pixies. Uh, universe creating pixies. He said this many times. Now it, he's saying it tongue in cheek, right? Mm -hmm. He's not saying it like the person you're talking about who thinks it's a really good argument. But but still, saying it tongue in cheek. If if we we only need one of those pixies, Occam's razor says to get rid of all the extra stuff you don't need to explain something. Mm -hmm. So we only need one pixie. It's a spaceless, timeless, non-material, sufficiently powerful universe creating pixie. Okay, you've just you've just. Uh, you just described God and then called God a pixie. You're yeah. a pixie theist, but welcome to theism, pixie theist. Yeah. So in, in other words, you know, if you say it's a teacup, well, teacups are in space and time and they're made of matter. So it's you're, it's it's mislabeling God as a teacup. It's pixies right. aren't don't they don't have all these qualities like they have wings, for instance, right? They exist with physical oh, but this bodies. Is a special pixie. This is special pixie, this is special that's spaceless pixie. and timeless. Yeah, in which case, it's just a, it's just yeah. a term. It's just I'm just going to come up with a right. now. To me, this is the last ditch effort to get away from saying it's God, um, and it demonstrates right. that that the argument has devolved where they don't have an a, an answer to it, and so they say something that at that point I'm like I don't know how to help you, man, because you're you're just you're just saying things. But um, let's take another uh, objection, which is, isn't this just a god of the gaps? argument isn't it really mm -hmm. just we don't know what caused it so god did it isn't that just a god of the gaps argument right so like ancient peoples might have seen lightning and not known what it was so it was god throwing thunderbolts or something right a mm -hmm. god we don't know what that is so we're going to say god did it um the the problem there is what you're doing that's a situation where you you don't you don't have any you don't have positive evidence for what it is so you're just putting god there we're actually giving you positive evidence for what 
for why this seems to be a spaceless, timeless, non-material, incredibly powerful, sufficiently wise mind. Um, we're, we're giving positive reasons to believe that. It's not that we don't know, so we're saying God. Um, <clears throat> so, so that's kind of how you respond. That's how I respond to that mm -hmm. uh, criticism. Yeah, it's like argument to the best explanation or looking for something that could sufficiently explain it. I mean, because you could go to the courtroom and say, well, that guy didn't commit the murder. You just have a Bob the murderer of the gaps. You know, you don't know how the knife got in that guy's head. You don't know how Bob's fingerprints got right. on the knife. You don't know how to explain his uh, his earlier death threats to that person. So you have a Bob of the gaps. But like, wait a minute, this is this is not, Bob it's not Bob of the gaps. <laughs> it's not God of the gaps. This is a uh, best explanation for the evidence. Sorry for my... Yeah. Cheese ball analogy, but I love um, that. Bob, I'm going to say Bob of the gaps from now on. I love that. <laughs> Bob of the gaps. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, let's take another one. Uh, what if science one day explains the beginning of the universe without God? Yeah. So two things about this. One is um, often we hear the criticism that this, if we accepted what you're saying right now, it'd be the end of science because why would we need to investigate any further? Why would cosmologists need to do their experiments and things like that? Christians are happy for people to continue, for the, the, you know, science to continue studying the beginning of the universe. We're not saying to stop that. In fact, we're even okay with scientists doing what we call methodological naturalism, where while they're studying it, while they're doing it, even people who are Christians who are scientists, you're, you're, we're not letting you posit supernatural stuff. You just push this as far as natural science can take it. We're fine with that. We're not self-conscious about that one bit, and we want that to continue because we think that Christianity is perfectly happy to be in the marketplace of ideas and it's going to be perfectly safe there. We're not worried about that and you should continue doing that. Uh, so so that's off the table. But the, the deeper thing here is, well, maybe if we just wait long enough and naturalism will get to it, that's kind of like a naturalism of the gaps, isn't it? We, it's not a bob mm -hmm. of the gaps anymore. It's a naturalism of the gaps. So Yeah, uh, because there is yeah. no indicator that this beginning was caused by some natural thing. And it's especially confusing because it's like bootstrapping. I mean, we're asking that something the existence of all nature was caused by nature, but all the things we use in nature to explain things are the things we're trying to explain. And so yeah. it, it seems really unlikely and tend to just say, well, what if it's, it's like the old meme uh, from dumb and dumber, right? Like, so you're saying there's a chance, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It ends right. up feeling that way. But it, yeah. It, it's it, it, Craig often says about it. This argument is not a bus where when you start to get uncomfortable, you can just get off the bus. This thing goes all the way, and you got to ride it all the way and follow the evidence where it leads, right? Mm -hmm. And so this thing goes far past a simple stopping point where we can say, I'm not comfortable with where this is heading, so we're just going to stop here and say, I don't know. Or stop here and say, I don't know, but maybe naturalism one day. Um, you can say, I don't know. But we need to make sure that we're being epistemically honest. If we can know a little bit more than that point, then we need to follow past that point to what we can know. Yeah. Yeah. If you only don't know whenever the obvious conclusion seems to be God, then I'm wondering why you don't know. Um, yeah. Why don't you know? <laughs> so here's the thought. Um, why would you say, let's say this cause is super powerful. Okay. It has sufficient power to create the whole universe. Um, it's not material. It's not in space. It's not limited by time. So it's not limited by any of these things. It has these sort of unlimited characteristics. But then we have this. Why would you think this being is personal? Why would you think it's personal? Yeah, so there are a couple of reasons. First off, remember, we're looking for something that can fit the category of spaceless, timeless, and non-material but that has causal power. So you'll recall at the beginning of the episode, we were talking about how like um, the number four uh, might exist that way, maybe, but it doesn't, it can't do anything, right? Uh, we need something that can do something and a mind would fit the bill. Now where someone might say here, okay, maybe it could, but that's not good enough. Um, how do I know that it did? Okay, well, there's a couple other things that I think are really good here. So first of all, we have different types of causation. And um, I, I, this can sound technical, but I don't think it is. Just hang with me. We have event, event causation. That's where, like, if I took a book and threw it through a window, the event caused the other event of the window breaking. Um, we understand that. We have state, state causation, where you've got, like, a frozen pond and a log resting on top of that pond. The state of the frozen pond is causing the state of the log to be suspended on top of the water. And then you have what's called state event causation. Now, state event causation is interesting. Imagine a man sitting in a chair, uh, and, and he's sitting there without moving, and then all of a sudden he stands up. He went from a state of sitting uh, without moving to an event of standing up from his chair. 
that state event causation requires in from a timeless state like this of nothingness it requires a decision to act out of this timelessness and to cause an event and so you get this state event causation and so that's a personal agent that explains that but then there's another one that i really like and it's this uh if you have nothing if you're in a state of timeless nothingness now there's no time no space no matter then that means that there is no causal chain like there's no dominoes falling like you can imagine there's no determinism is what we mean mm -hmm. um and so if there's no determinism to cause an event to take place and there's nothing random happening because there's no time or space for anything random to happen then that means that whatever caused the universe to come into existence must have had what we call libertarian freedom, free will, the ability to decide. Well, what sort of things have the ability to decide? Well, personal agents do, right? Mm -hmm. So there are two or three good reasons to think that it's a personal agent. Another one that we could layer on top of that is simply this. Um, and this kind of would get into another argument, the design argument that some of you all are probably familiar with. Uh, you probably heard about design arguments at least. And we have to remember that this universe that did begin to exist began to exist in such a way that life would be possible. It kind of all worked. And that seems to indicate a certain level of thought, forethought, planning, those kind of things. Yeah, and to me, that to that's the most compelling one to me personally, because it just clicks, you know, in my thinking is that I look at the universe and I think this is um, this is planned. Like there, there's an, there's intent here for creating life. And then we can bring the argument for fine tuning alongside this as well and say, look, you know, the the improbability of the random occurrence of the laws of physics along with the 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 quantities of of material and immaterial well material things in the universe along with the way chemistry works together all these things to allow for life to exist is um astounding and it, it seems like it requires a planning thoughtful creator um but now <clears throat> here's a thought some uh this is the last objection then we're gonna then we're gonna go to uh, your guys questions from the live chat so i'm interested to see what kind of questions we'll get today hoping for some pushback and hopefully we can bring helpful answers to you um some would say well braxton this only gets you god okay fine you have god but what you don't have is the god of the bible and you you really you really need more than that uh what are your responses to that well i want people to notice here that when when we've listed off these different things spaceless timeless non-material incredibly powerful exceedingly wise mind we have given a justification for each of those things now uh, perhaps if you're a skeptic you say yeah but i got more questions well that's fine that's fair you can have more questions and you can present challenges but i want you to know we're not just ad hoc just slapping up all these things that we like and often that's how it's framed when philosophy professors at universities um i have a, a video from recently where i showed a, a philosophy professor doing this very thing and on youtube videos people will say this is the part of the argument where people just put in whatever they want a christian god that answers prayers and heals people and all that um we're not saying that we are just saying that this gives you theism which is god it gives you a personal god mm -hmm. um but people like me and like mike i think are the kinds of apologists that would say all right we would give this argument to give you a good reason to believe in god but then we would follow it with something like a case for the resurrection of jesus because then we would put a name tag on that god right mm -hmm. then we would we would uh, we, we want to show that there's a god because then that's a good explanation for God raising Jesus from the dead, mm -hmm. but we would follow it with a case for the resurrection. So a person yeah. would be right to say, yeah, this doesn't give you everything you want, but it's a beginning point. It's a, it's the first part of this case, uh, or can be for Christian theism. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think that's pretty significant. And we could, we have to realize too, it, it doesn't get you, um, all of scripture and all of the Christian doctrine, but I'm sorry, if, if you're atheist and you now have a description of God that fits the Bible, although it doesn't affirm everything the Bible affirms yet, it fits the Bible. I'm like thinking, how is this not a big win? You know, how is this not right. a wonderful right. thing? I've ruled out a bunch of other religious views. I've isolated it down to a handful of like Abrahamic religions that, you know, we have, we have Judaism, Christianity. I don't know if Islam really fits this, but we have just a handful. And then now we can take it to the next step and continue the discussion. And also when we bring evidence for prophecy in the Bible or for the miracles of Jesus, you no longer feel compelled to reject it because you don't believe in God. You now realize miracles are at least possible because God exists. 
let's evaluate whether one happened with the resurrection of Jesus. And so this is part of a, 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 this is a huge movement. You know, if you go from not believing in God to believing in God, that's a quite a big deal, quite a big deal. And this is just one argument. This is just one argument amongst right. a slew of arguments we can offer for God's existence.